Hello and welcome to Messages for Men with me, Elizabeth Hobson, leader of Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, our design director, Max Anthony, and Greta Aurora. She is a blog contributor, a YouTuber, a muse, and an artist in her own right. And today our subject is women, actually, and we're going to use a title which is a Jordan Peterson quote that I have as my Twitter banner, um, which he said in conversation with Camille Pallia, he said that women need to reign in their crazy sisters. And we're gonna talk about how we're gonna do it. Am I right? Yeah, that sounds good to me. It's not just how we're gonna do it. I suppose it's also, you've gotta like identify the, the crazy sisters and then you've gotta kind mm -hmm. of wonder do about it so or are they easy to identify is that is that where I'm already wrong <laughs> <laughs> I think you can tell pretty early on with a conversation with them like by the end of their first or second sentence <laughs> usually or at least I am pretty good at identifying crazy women yeah yeah I think that there are blessedly few really crazy women. Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, that some of the most significantly crazy women have an awful lot of power and influence, mm. you know, and they are creating situations in which men and boys are disadvantaged and women and girls are privileged. And you know, I think there is a need and there is also a potential to reach the majority non-feminist, non-crazy women and say, you know, we have to end this situation. Wasn't that um, Karen's, like the... the Yes, Karen Strawn at the International Conference on Men's Issues 2018 delivered a speech titled... Um, women must consign feminism to the dustbin of history. I suppose you might need a more condensed version of that that needs to go ultra, ultra viral. But um, it's finding the, the best way of, of, of communicating that. But I think that both you and Greta are hugely instrumental in, in being able to do that because somewhat unsurprisingly, when, when a man said, like, there's a reason why Ava Brighton's video about, uh -huh. what was the title for that now? Um, are, are almost all women mentally insane? Yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason why, why that got the, uh, why that got attention, you know? Yeah, it was her mm. vagina phone. <laughs> and I've done a video on how women manipulate men and that has done quite well too. Yes, I, I, I saw that. I saw that recently where um, you were talking about Esther Vila's book, weren't yeah. you? Yes. That was the book that inspired me to look more into the topic. Mm. Yeah. Is that The Manipulated Man? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't read that yet. Does that have quite a bit to say on this, on this subject then, in terms of the crazy sisters? Definitely. I mean, it is really the other extreme of the spectrum. You know, if on one extreme we have the crazy men hating feminists, then it is the, the polar opposite of that. And I don't agree with everything she says either. I think you have to take it with a pinch of salt. It's difficult to tell whether she's serious, completely serious about everything she's saying, but there's a lot of truth and a lot of wisdom to what she's arguing. And she was a medical doctor. She's obviously a very educated woman and she had her own career obviously she worked with both men and women and she's talking from experience from observing the dynamics mm. between couples between people mm. and that was that book was written quite a while ago wasn't it so i assume in the early that, 70s yeah i, I it's assume a direct reaction to second wave feminism mm. i'd imagine that um that what she says about on that subject of crazy sisters is is still very relevant now a lot of it is very relevant although she concentrates on the housewife provider dynamic which i pointed mm. out in the beginning of my video that mm. that's still relevant to some extent 
But her starting point basically is that women don't work and women don't want to work. And they're like parasites sucking money and life out of men. And that's true. And now they're to parasites su- sucking money and life out of men and working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be taken out of context. <laughs> the culture has changed a little bit. Mm. The, the underlying mechanisms of manipulation yeah. haven't changed. Yeah. But the cultural context is yeah, slightly Yeah, our natures have not changed. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And craziness doesn't change. It just gets louder and facilitated uh, in, in various ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, we were talking before the podcast, though, Greta and I, about nature, actually, and about how, I mean, you know, Karen in her um, Women Must Consign Feminism to the Dustbin of History suggested that what we need to do is make anti-feminism fashionable you know and me and Greta were talking about how the way to reach women who have been seduced by this kind of victimhood feminism that tells them if you fail in life it's because you know the deck is stacked against you and you're you had no control over it and if you succeed you did it against all the odds you know is to give back to women something that we've traditionally had throughout cultures which is a celebration and a reverence for women's divine nature you know tell women that you are powerful and you can do whatever you want yeah and that's exactly my reason for being an anti-feminist i've always rejected the idea of being a victim and having to be lifted up you know, by the government or, or whoever. I hate the idea of quotas. I hate the mm. idea of forcing women to pursue just a very, very narrowly defined life path that mm. feminists approve of. And I've mm. always felt like instinctively that women had always been at least as powerful as men, mm-hmm. perhaps even more powerful in a, in a different way. Mm-hmm. But I definitely don't subscribe to the idea that women have ever been oppressed by anyone anywhere in history yeah yeah we had power in different spheres and women's power was intensely significant and it's I find it incredibly offensive to be honest I find that offensive (laughs) Um, but I do you know that we we look back on women throughout history and we go, oh, they, they were treated like chattel and they accepted it. It's like, no, fuck you. Women were like strong and powerful and awesome beings to behold, you know. And they, they did have power. They didn't have power in the narrow way that feminists now recognize power, you know, because to a feminist, the only power is money and political authority <laughs> or, you know, um, managerial authority being a CEO whereas there is you know the kind of sexual power and the social power that women have has always been extensive and the intellectual power in a like I remember one of the things that um you were talking about with with Paul Greta when you were talking about that subject Paul I think brought up like Mary Curie and and others who I would hope that, that that those women, and I would expect those women would have the same reaction to gender quotas that you would, because yeah. they would rightly recognize the harm that does to their own accomplishment. Yeah, it's Completely. patronizing. It's I condescending. Know. It's misogyny. Gender <laughs> quotas are misogyny. Exactly. Do they recognize that on some kind of sub, like, unconscious level and then that's one of the things one of the many things that contributes to the crazy sisters is is that what it is it's just this kind of build up of cognitive dissonance that eventually just explodes and then you're screaming in your car <laughs> yeah i mean they're starting from the premise that throughout history there's been this oppressor and oppressed dynamic among men and women and obviously it's largely inspired by marxism that there's always, you know, the master and slave dynamic. They just need this black and white mm. sort of dichotomy. If you have two groups of people, 
and you see the slightest amount of difference between those two groups, then you immediately have to look at power because power is the only thing that matters in the world. Yeah. So let's just examine which one has more power than the other. And then the, and then the one that doesn't have more power is obviously oppressed. And, but then the, their definition of power is, is lacking nuance. Mm -hmm. It's very, very restrictive. They mm -hmm. only approve of a very masculine yeah. definition of power. Yeah. And as Elizabeth, Great irony. as Elizabeth pointed out, they completely disregard a whole other universe of feminine power, which is not just sexuality. That's a large part of it. It also has to do with our biologically programmed gynocentric tendencies. Again, it's a difficult one to separate, obviously, nature from nurture. We don't know exactly to what extent mm -hmm. we are wired to protect women, but it is a fact that throughout it's a constant. All human civilizations, mm. yeah, women are protected because their reproductive resources are very valuable to, to society. A limiting factor in reproduction. Yeah, mm. yeah because obviously, in, in theory, a man could have a child every time he has an orgasm. A man could have thousands and thousands of children, and some men mm. like Genghis Khan had yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, probably thousands of children, whereas a woman, you know, like 20... 20 children throughout a woman's life is really pushing it. So yeah. That's... Also, there's also the other factor that I think that you've touched on in at least one of the, one of your speeches, Elizabeth, where and the neotenous features thing comes. Yeah, yeah. That, it, it provokes that a reaction that same... that's like based on the human tendency to protect children. You know, that's why women's features are more childlike because biologically then we need protecting, her. you know. That's yeah, and evolutionary then, bias, and then I believe. Exactly. And, and then artificially inflating that and yeah. emphasizing that in terms of a, a kind of strange protection signaling. And it's all about protection. I think that all instances, at least most instances, feminists interpret as oppression are really overprotection. And I think yeah. we see this in Muslim countries, exactly. for example, shielding women from the outside world and yeah. protecting them like precious diamonds, yeah. as if they were made of glass yeah. or crystal. And they, they call it, you know, feminists call that misogyny, but it's like they're protecting women because they think that if a man, say, sees a woman's hair, he's not going to be able to help himself but rape her. You know, that sounds like misandry, not misogyny to me. It's a strange thing of both. And I think I was reminded when you were saying that about um, there was a, a TV show from quite a while ago. It was, it was fascinating to watch. It was it was focusing on people from different religions like Sikhs and, and Muslims and Christians and how they go about like dating. And they had um, they had this one guy who um, probably uh, drew a few short straws when it came to uh, attractiveness. In other words, he was unusually short for a man and he didn't have a full head of hair. And um, I remember a, a quote word for word from him where he was, uh, he said, I want to treat her like gold, give her everything she wants. And I wanted to reach through the computer monitor and say, look, if you treat her like gold, that's not giving her what she wants. Like deep down in terms of an actual relationship, that's not what she wants. Yeah, but I think that women are confused by, you know, Cosmo and whatever they read that, you know, mm. that being treated like gold is what they want and it's what they deserve. You know, I think there are a lot of messages out there in the cultural sphere and that's on all kind of levels because, you know, in terms of like feminist literature, you've got um, Naomi Wolf's Vagina. <laughs> Um, which she, she talks about, there's a moment where she says that she knows all of these women and they had these really good husbands who were kind and good providers and good fathers to their children. And these women all left their partners, you know, and why did they do it? And she says they did it because they were bored. And I was like, wow, you know, is this where she's going to say, so buck your ideas up, women, that's not acceptable. But no, <laughs> instead, she devotes an entire chapter to explaining to men how to stop their women getting bored. And everything she says, it's like this long, long list of like often contradictory advice. 
you know, that no human being could ever achieve. Be spontaneous, but, you know, be reliable and um, surprise her and be dangerous, but not scary. And, you know, it's like, oh my God. And she then gives literally zero advice to women on how to make their husband or partner happy. And then you have popular music and stuff like that, that all has kind of basically broadly similar messages about women being just innately valuable and they don't have to do anything. And in fact, even if they don't just not do anything, but they are actively like abusive, coercive, um, cheating, it's always his fault. <laughs> And all these messages about how men have to sacrifice for women, which I think are really harmful. Yeah, and it's also treating both men and women as monolithic groups. And I'm not a fan of generalizations. I do think a liberation of women was needed, but liberation of men was needed too. Yeah. And I think yeah. the whole point of the liberation of the sexes is to let people do whatever they want and not all yeah. men and women want the same thing so no. you can't even you can't really give advice you can't really give dating no. advice no. to all men and all women because they're just not all the same no i i suppose you know i think actually i i would give dating advice to all men and all women i would say that almost all men and women should go their own way for a period mm. so they can learn about themselves, get comfortable with their own um, company, um, work out what it is that they need from a relationship and what they want from a relationship. So, you know, I'm fully on board with MGTOW, I'm fully on board with WIGTOW and would like to see people really considering, you know, what, what is going to work for them. Um, and then I think, you know, there has to be respect and there has to be love, sincere, open hearted, genuine love between people, you know, not using women as sex objects, which I don't think happens very often, but, you know, for balance um, and not using men as success objects, soulmates, not role mates, as Warren Farrell likes to say. Mm. That needs to be on a T-shirt. I can imagine when you were talking, when you're talking about, um, you said it was Naomi Wolf's book, didn't you? <laughs> it was Naomi yeah. Wolf's vagina, I, indeed. Yeah, I can imagine a, a woman, and it's most likely to be a woman, of course, reading that yeah. and look, looking through the advice for men and going, right, okay, some of this makes sense, that's contradictory. And then excitedly turning the page thinking, okay, here's, here's the bit where I get empowered, where where I can learn something, what can I do? Like, wh like here's, here's what the other people can do. What, what's something I can do right now or tomorrow or like what's something I can change like and her turning the page and just being greeted with and now the next chapter and she's like where's I don't what? know I mean what I imagine is women reading that and ticking off the list going my fella doesn't do that doesn't do that he's done that but he doesn't do that and you know becoming bitter and resentful because that man doesn't fulfill Naomi Wolf's expectations. That's probably but the- Her uh, absurd, yeah. ridiculous expectations. So she's trying to encourage more women to, to get bored and yeah. leave their partners. Yeah. Basically. There is actually a recently released book. The title is something literally like, why he's not good enough for you and why you should leave. It's self-help, but it's basically self-harm. It also, feeds into the queer theory and stuff like one of the chapters is called something like why you should leave your boyfriend and i i don't want to try and get too conspiratorial but there was something in there about how maybe you're queer you you look at some of the stuff to do with it like some of the graphics and stuff and you think okay this must be satire but it's it, no it's genuinely real this is naked and blatant your boyfriend must be terrible because men are terrible and you know, maybe you should look into uh, into being attracted to women. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, which is more pernicious? Feminists, the likes of Naomi Wolf, are far more dangerous than radical feminists because they have this mask of respectability and, you know, niceness and pleasantness. And 
I think people can get drawn into their, that persona and that kind of victimhood feminism is just radical feminism with a mask on. That's all it is. You know, it's the same underlying principles. It's the same oppressor yeah. oppressed thing. It's just as harmful. It still divides the sexes vertically, toxifies mm. our relations. And, and I think we all understand what's at the root of this. It's, it's not about empowering women. It's not about women at all. It's about tearing down the family structure mm. and undermining Western culture because yeah. these people believe there's something inherently evil and yeah. oppressive about Western culture. And the best way to destroy a culture is to destroy the foundation of culture, the basic yeah. building block, which yeah. is supposed to be the family. And I think that's just a thread that runs through all of feminism. Again, Marxist influences. Mm. I found the book. It's called Women Don't Owe You Pretty, Florence Given. It's marketed for younger women, essentially a kind yeah. of... Women with attitude. Yeah, so it says, Women Don't Owe You Pretty will tell you to love sex, hate sexism, protect your goddamn energy, life is short, dump them, and that oh. you owe men nothing, least of all pretty. So it's... It's, it, it really is that kind of thing of not just the men aren't fulfilling your expectations and that you're perfect as you are. There's also there's this message that then goes even further than that of saying not just you're perfect as you are, but in all likelihood, you're probably doing too much already to please <laughs> your partner. And yeah. like you need to, it, it's Stop amazing. Stop shaving your armpits and, you know, washing your face. But it's like, life is short, dump them. It's got to be one of the first self-harm books. I really think it's utterly criminal how feminists are waging this war on feminine beauty. You know, like, feminine beauty is ephemeral and it's divine and it should be celebrated and enjoyed. And to be honest, maybe... That's something that we can use because, you know, the beauty industry is not getting any smaller. You know, women are not buying fewer lovely dresses. Women love dressing up and playing. It's one of the greatest pleasures of being a woman, being able to, you know, create your persona and, you know, paint your face and put on nice clothes that are individualistic to a degree that, you know, most men don't kind of feel they're able to do and so yeah you know maybe that is something that we can attack feminists with yeah and one of their main talking points is that beauty standards are constructed by the patriarchy male gaze and they're inherently yeah. oppressive and i recently put together this graphic i love it about the epitome of female beauty in different cultures going back seven thousand years and you see we have like a little statuette from 5000 BC mm. where we already see the ideal ways to hip ratio. And yeah. <laughs> that's like the oldest record we have yeah. of it. Yes, I, and, saw, I saw that. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. going back 7000 years, it just hasn't changed that much. Obviously, we see depictions of mother figures, which are not meant to be erotic, but we're talking about depictions of beautiful women. Mm. And they all have strikingly similar waist to hip and bust ratios and it just makes evolutionary sense you know because these are the characteristics that signal fertility in a woman it just makes sense mm. that a, a woman like this is more likely to give birth to healthy children therefore the men who chose to reproduce with women like this were more likely to pass on their genes so these preferences have been passed down through many many generations so do you think that, that kind of attack is going to be successful then? Because like the, the book facts. I mentioned, the no women facts. don't know the pretty. Hmm? Well, like covering topics such as body image, toxic beauty standards and identities by patriarchy, etc. I sometimes I'm, I, I have your attitude, Elizabeth, of, of just no chance. You're, 
you're you're mm-hmm. trying to you know you're trying to push water up a hill using a stick but then but then sometimes i start to worry that that um when you when you get people to believe such absurdities then anything is anything is possible calm my worries liz go on no i mean i think that you know obviously we've all seen the memes before feminism and after feminism it's an aesthetic (laughs) self-harm they go from being you know attractive young women to being like just looking scary so you know on individual levels yeah books like that will ruin the appearance of some women but I just think the vast majority of women enjoy the fun and the power that they can derive from just from their femininity yeah (laughs) yeah I've always believed that a woman is most powerful if she embraces and expresses her femininity and that's not just sexually but feminine traits yeah like Like, mannerisms yeah just exhibiting a caring nurturing nature can stir a woman towards even career paths where she will feel more fulfilled and not all women are like that obviously some women do want to hold political positions and they want to yeah run people over and be well because (laughs) but that's still a minority of most women Yeah, you're absolutely right, because you can see in the criminal justice system that, you know, traditionally beautiful woman will be treated preferentially as compared to like a masculine woman. There was a study, and I think it was conducted in the UN, but essentially what they found was that women who are traditionally feminine are more likely to get both men and women to agree with pursuing the policies that they want. That's interesting. Mm. It also makes sense because, you know, studies have shown that both men and women like looking at beautiful women. Mm -hmm. If you look at women's magazines, you know, they, they have beautiful women on the cover and women buy those magazines. So they don't buy those magazines because they, they hate what they're saying they're drawn to it yeah. and, and they produce pheromones that make them feel good looking at those images and uh, that's been along with the grid girls and all of those other areas that's been one of those things where that's been attacked and then men have enthusiastically not just jumped on board there was a um a technology magazine called t3 and um they used to have uh, beautiful women on on the cover the least someone would have on would be like a swimsuit or just like tight clothing or something. And it became this kind of big explosion some, quite some time ago, at least like a maybe a decade ago. And that was so old fashioned. And it's like, as, as yeah, you pointed out. Don't, Brooke, it's don't you know, it's 2020 and men no longer enjoy looking at beautiful women. We're actually, yeah. we, we used to be a sexually reproducing species, but it's all... um. Uh, and it, it's, as though, it's as though they they looked at the graphic that you that you made Greta it's it's like they they have this weird belief that they can drop a hammer on part of the and, and just like kind of end time like we can just take these beauty standards and just say oh no it ends here it's like hubris you know this we have transcended the human condition I think it, luckily enough, it kind of creeped back in where they kind of realized that actually when you just put the picture of the fancy car on the cover, you know, because it's like a technology magazine, so they'll have, you know, very, very, very technologically advanced car. They realized that women aren't picking up this magazine because it's not catching their eye and men aren't picking up this magazine any more than they're picking up all of the car magazines. They realized that actually beauty and specifically faces because obviously humans are are wired to to seek the pattern of faces that's how it works Mm -hmm. and all of these the images of of women that they had used before they were never object in the sense of you're just seeing body parts or something on on the front cover because obviously that'd be weird right Mm -hmm. so it's always a this is a beautiful person and we're associating that with all of their beautiful technology don't you want to see more of this beautiful person and learn more about this beautiful technology 
they then essentially realize that they can't avoid that. They can't pretend that beauty doesn't exist and they can't hold on to some kind of weird ideological principle at the expense of being able to actually sell their magazines. You're smiling, Elizabeth. Like it, it, It's because you're, you're happy that you realize they understood that beauty mattered. Yeah, absolutely. Get woke, go broke. And this mm. denial of an inherent beauty, I think it's a symptom of a deeper underlying denial of human nature as a whole mm. and all the constituent pieces of our nature. And it ties in with the denial of biological sex mm -hmm. and gender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just staring it all down and treating people as a blank slate Who's, yeah. whose mind can be perpetually transformed and, and molded according to how we want them to turn out. Mm -hmm. And that's very dangerous because it's quite obvious that instincts do matter and there's something about human nature that's just inherent and constant throughout history and civilizations. And denying that nature is not going to make anyone happy. Mm -hmm. It might make sense in theory, giving them the benefit of the doubt. They could potentially think that this could be the great equalizer because if mm -hmm. we are all nothing, then at, you know, we are all nothing the in the same way. <laughs> and then we can kind of mold mm -hmm. our psyche to conform mm -hmm. to whatever standards we have. Everyone is then equally miserable. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Once you've deconstructed toxic beauty standards and you've deconstructed toxic masculinity and you have no intention of putting either of them back together again and even if you could you wouldn't know where to start because that's not something that any sane human would would attempt to do it's the weirdest goal ever and if aliens landed on earth and you tried to kind of explain to them that this is the goal of a whole bunch, <laughs> bunch of people then um I, th I think they would get back in their spaceship and leave just back up like that famous meme of Homer Simpson kind of edging back into the yeah. hedge. <laughs> I think that there is a really important place if we want to rein in our crazy sisters for telling women with logical and rational arguments what the situation is, how men and boys are facing injustices and are suffering, you know, how if we allow men and boys to suffer, you can't poison half a well. It's going to hurt women and girls too, in many ways. But I think that there is this key that Karen recognized, you know, when she said that we need to make anti-feminism fashionable. And it's kind of giving everybody back the joyous old god of like female divinity and accepting and celebrating all of the wonderful aspects of femininity that feminists seek to destroy and deny. I agree with, with Greta in, in, in having a dislike for generalization. So yeah. there are indeed, there are indeed feminists who, who will fully embrace that kind of That's divinity true. stuff to, yeah. to a kind of, yeah. to a kind of crazy level but it's feminism it still maintains a this has to be kept for yourself you can't share this with with men because men are horrible that's another reason why naomi wolf is dangerous because not only does she come across as pleasant and moderate but she's also you know she's beautiful and we do listen to beautiful women and we trust them and we we want to agree with them it sounds like I'm focusing too much on this book, but it just, it really just makes me pissed off. The author, she's got to be at least as attractive as Naomi Wolf or, or more attractive. Like from the kind of small thumbnail I've got, she practically looks like, like Alicia Silverstone. Oh, damn. Maybe if I look at a larger picture, I'll just be like, no, nope, totally wrong. Sorry, Alicia, that, I didn't mean that. But the message and the end of what Waterston says about it, it says, after all, you are the love of your own life. And that, that's the idea of you're great, you're amazing. And whatever you do, don't share your amazingness with men. I'm going to close the tab for that book. So otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'll it's kind of similar to wanting to equalize wealth again from a Marxist socialist perspective. Mm. You know, if everyone had the same wealth all over the world, that would mean we would all be poor, but we would all be equal at least. Obviously, if you if you have nothing to lose, that idea would appear to you, and that's mm. probably true with 
<laughs> beauty and femininity too in a in a way you know so as beautiful and attractive as these authors are a large chunk of their target audience is probably women who feel like they're having trouble conforming to these ideals anyway and then mm. there are women who could or who have an inherent drive to embrace their beauty but they but they're just brainwashed into going against that mm. but obviously there are women who are not conventionally feminine and and there's nothing wrong with that and these sorts of messages might be reassuring so mm. on some level it might it, it's probably good to have voices like this who speak to women who who don't want to aspire to traditional ideals and and goals well but, i think the best thing that's ever happened for non-conventionally attractive women is the pornography industry and like the way that's exploded because whatever you think is wrong with you you know like small tits fat ass beard <laughs> if you put that into Pornhub you will find that there are men who love it it's a great point okay uh, somehow you've managed to bring up Pornhub in this conversation as well <laughs> <laughs> is that your thing it, it needs so, someone needs to create like I don't know, scorecards or something. Everyone should take a shot when Elizabeth says Pornhub. <laughs> yeah, there's a, make Elizabeth Hobson bingo game. <laughs> it's great advertisement the... for Pornhub, by the way. <laughs> I know, they sh I should um, <laughs> ask if they want to sponsor me. It would be worth it, for know, actually, yeah. for both our channels. I don't know how you're going to fit that into your TEDx speech somehow. You know, you're talking about <laughs> the, the secrets of fatherhood and yet, and and somehow somehow she manages to slip in a kind of you can buy like in the same way you can buy like hats and and shirts and stuff for playboy or something yeah i think you can do that same thing with pornhub you could walk on on stage at tedx with just kind of you know like <laughs> pornhub trailers and, uh, trailers and and you know i want to look that up now but i suspect it's gonna just like auto play or something isn't it so in the background you're just gonna hear and this was something that, that came up in your discussion with Paul Elam. J4MB or, or A Voice for Men will be blocked by the uh, content filter that's, that's coming through on the tethering. But, um, but Pornhub will work just fine. It's just an algorithm. It's just an algorithm. This has got to be the first time Algorithms on one of these. Algorithms that spontaneously come into being, not created by people, honest. Someone who's uh, doing one of these podcasts could indeed be browsing Pornhub in the background, but this is one of the times I get to actually do it. Like someone gets to actually, do, <laughs> someone gets to actually do that live. I wish I could screen share like your face, Elizabeth. This like, this is audio only, but um, there's there's a I don't know how you pronounce this. Namelia X Pornhub Herotica racing dress for 120 pounds, and it's mm -hmm. like um. So you know you know like I'm the, gonna have the to crowdfund it. <laughs> yeah you know the grid girls kind of outfit yeah. where it's yeah. a kind of tight thing and and you see on their porn i hub. i do go to Pornhub, but i go for the comment sections some of the comment sections are really interesting it's like the way camille pallia says that she listens to like talk radio shows about sport because it's a male space and men just being masculine and interacting like men that's what happens in Pornhub comment sections hang on I'm gonna get my phone and read you because I do screenshot them <laughs> so in a podcast discussion about reigning in crazy sisters I think we might have embraced the crazy by going to pornhubapparel.com and reading out comments right okay this is a comment under pornography this is why I love men right so I've missed out who made the initial comment, but this poster says, why do we assume the core of a black hole has a singularity in it? How does it make sense that something can be infinitely dense, i.e. have zero volume? I could understand it if a black hole was an object of finite but extreme density, then its escape velocity would still be stronger than the speed of light. But the laws of physics would still make sense at the core because space would not have infinite curvature there. But why do people say black holes have infinite density? And Big Boy 132 responded, I think they refer to it as infinite simply because we don't know for sure. So it's not really infinite so much as it's indefinite. We are unable to define its density due to the size of it. 
So it's fairly safe to assume it goes on forever for all intensive purposes. <laughs> you see what I mean? People don't believe me when I say I go there for the comments sections, but I do. Well, this is, this is what happens though, isn't it? They'll be having arguments like that on Pornhub. Yeah. And they'll forget what website they're on. Like while yeah. they're writing this and getting really into cosmological mechanics of this and yeah. the wife will walk past and he's just like, don't worry, I'll just, you know, someone's wrong on the internet. <laughs> and, she, and she will notice what website he's on. And it's just like that excuse of I'm just here for the comments, I don't think will work in his case. <laughs> Before we finish up, I'd just like to appeal to everybody because although I frequent it, I, I can't read every comment on Pornhub. So if you do see a good comment, please do tweet it at me. I'll appreciate it. And that also tag like, me in the tweet. Please. Yeah. <laughs> it, that, sounds, that sounds like, um, because An obviously... <laughs> <laughs> please send us links to Pornhub, please. <laughs> I, I'm going to, I, I almost, to regret that. <laughs> I almost want to say that you are, but I, I, I suspect you're not. I suspect <laughs> you're just going to be like, this is brilliant. I don't even have to visit Pornhub anymore. They just appear in my inbox now, just out of kind of pure curiosity. The comments that you read out, was there anything in the video title that might suggest it had anything Gosh, to do no. with faith? Or? Gosh, no. Okay. Absolutely zero. It wasn't like it did It wasn't, oh. no, no. <laughs> That'd be, yeah. God, that'd be cool though, wouldn't yeah. it? Like sexy physics teacher. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. There's, plenty of, there's pe plenty of room for double entendres and, and stuff with, with that, isn't there? Mm. So I suspect then that it's, it's kind of wasted on them because no one's watching it. They're just in the comments, just arguing about the kind of thing that you think you need at least two degrees to be able to talk about this. Maybe that's what it is, that the uh, academia has become so strangleholded and everything that they're just like, the only way that you can have a free and open discussion without political biases and stuff, there's all these physicists and cosmologists on Pornhub just <laughs> arguing and ha doing the real work. That's where they're, do that's where they're doing the real work on Pornhub.com. <laughs> so it was a thing years ago, um, some team of people wanted to find out who was particularly intelligent on Facebook and so they kind of looked through you know all the algorithms like combed their way through and it turned out that the biggest determiner of someone having a high IQ was that they liked a page about curly fries and they kind of explained that how it happened is that this page was set up and one of the very early likers had a high IQ and it started popping up in his friends' feeds and they all had high IQs. And then, you know, <laughs> like their friends started liking it and they all had high IQs. And I don't know if it's still true, you know, because probably loads of stupid people like me saw the video and went and liked it to try and fool people into thinking we had some brains. But maybe the number of Pornhub windows open in your browser is a direct predictor of intelligence too. That sounds like the kind of thing that needs further study. <laughs> I mean, it kind of makes sense because I think men do need a release every mm. once in a while mm. to really be able to stay focused. Mm. So it kind of makes sense for men to have an orgasm and then engage in really yeah. deep intellectual yeah. discussions once yeah. that's out of the way. I didn't think of that, but yeah, that's like an amazing theory, isn't it? That they don't leave, they don't bother leaving the website. They just, I'd, I'd love to right do now. a study like that though, with a control group and like a proper peer reviewed study with a few hundred participants. Get Pornhub to, to sponsor it. Is it something to think about actually? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, don't they have like a, um, a research arm or something? I'm sure I sent you a kind of really professionally done breakdown of, of a whole load of, of statistics and, and things that have changed over time and like it, beautifully presented. Regarding kind of what specific demographics like to watch. Searches, like most popular searches, right? It did have that, but I think that maybe to end a, uh, to kind of give their research a kind of air of legitimacy so they're not just them. Um, then they're not just, it's not some kind of infomercial. I think they also had other stuff there that didn't directly relate to, to their business. So it means that they can then claim a certain kind of legitimacy that they wouldn't otherwise have, because otherwise it's just, 
it's uh, it's like all those kind of companies that um, that say, oh well, uh, you know, studies show that people prefer to have a uh, a lawn that has been mowed by an electric mm-hmm. lawnmower, and, yeah. and we just happen to sell those. What a surprise! Yeah. But um, I would imagine if you approach them with some with some kind of detailed proposal, that they would um, that they would probably actually embrace that. I don't know how we got onto the talking of black holes. We have li- we've kind of circled around. You've sucked us in, Elizabeth. Sucked, into the... us, sucked us all into Pornhub again. <laughs> so, do you want to take us out then, Elizabeth? Like, take us out of the black hole and then end. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, regarding crazy sisters, I think that women are being brainwashed and harmed and we have antidotes to it we can give them facts and reason we can give them gratitude we can give them joy and you know celebration of what they are and what they have and i hope we can pull our relationships back from the brink yeah i agree for some listeners who who haven't heard of you Greta where can people go to find out more about your work well, I have a website gretaaurora.com on youtube you'll find me at youtube.com/gretaaurora i'm also on mm-hmm. facebook instagram and twitter and follow greta on twitter because you have a, a whole load of really great stuff very beautifully presented it's a wonder you don't have like you know a hundred thousand followers on Twitter, and the same goes for Elizabeth. We'll get there eventually. Yeah. If we don't get kicked off Twitter first. Wow. <laughs> Maybe that's what happens. We need to open accounts on Pornhub and 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 just. Yeah. Do I, I mean, because I don't have one already, so. <laughs> this will be audio only, but um, but when Elizabeth said, "I don't have one," Elizabeth looked down. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm. I'm going to end it there. But yeah. So um. So if people want to find out more about you, Greta, they can go to your website and, and Twitter and Instagram and all all that kind of stuff. And for people who want to find out more about J Four MB, they they've already already be on the website. But go on, Elizabeth. Aha. Yeah, our website is j 4 mborguk We have a YouTube channel. If you put J4MB in the search bar, then it will come up, Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. I'm on Twitter at antifembot.com. And we'll put all these links in the description anyway, right? What about you, dear design director? I exist within J... I, 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 I'm he not... He has no person. life outside of these podcasts. I don't exist. I'm, I'm kind <laughs> of... Only on... Only on... imagination. Yeah, exactly. Only on Pornhub or something. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you, Greta and Max, for joining me. And thanks to everybody for listening. Au revoir.